Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And uh, <clears throat> we have some difficult questions to answer today. Uh, but, uh, we definitely can't do it with the human intellect alone. So before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful um, that we can be here, that we are studying these things this morning. And uh, we invite your spirit in the presence of thy son into our lives, into this study. And we seek to tackle um, the understanding of a passage that is a mystery and that needs wisdom. And so we ask for wisdom from above to guide and direct us. We know, Lord, that the understanding of these things is not meant to be just an intellectual curiosity, a puzzle but is part of your word that is meant to develop our characters and to increase our faith and trust in you. We know that you give us light for the times that we are in. You give us light for our feet. And so we just pray, Lord, that um, we can uh, use this light from the past to guide us and that we can stay upon the path. Bless each person who's studying these things, those around the world who are struggling in various ways with the difficulties and trials that we face, and help us to depend upon you. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so yesterday we were discussing Revelation chapter 17, and we're getting to that pit place where we're addressing the riddle, right? This uh, puzzle that's given. Now, I'm just going to go back away from this. This is just comparing the King James and I could have even done it as this instead. Like that. So you have the King James with the Greek. And here you can see the Greek numbers on the left side with the King James. And then here on the Greek, this is the text New Testament, and it has uh, the Greek, but it also shows the part of speech uh, for each of the words. And since I'm not great at Greek, I, I'm really dependent upon this tool. Um, but because I'm so bad at Greek, um, this tool doesn't always help me. But we're going to look at some of the things uh, using this tool. Um, but for now, we're just going to go to King James. <clears throat> and <clears throat> so just to kind of give us a an overview of what it is we're trying to accomplish. So this whole study was uh, commissioned, we'll say, by Colin. He wanted us to study... Uh, Daniel chapter 10, 11, and 12, specifically the first part of Daniel chapter 11, but a more comprehensive study of Daniel 11. And, and that was because I had said that I wanted to study Daniel 11 in more detail in the future, and but I never got there. We ended up doing a whole study on understanding the lines for, for well over a year. So... Um, so he wanted me to go back to this study. Now, the reason that we're studying this has to do with Colin's prediction regarding Trump. That Trump is going to become reelected and he's going to be, be the one that brings in the Sunday law. But he does this with an understanding of Daniel chapter three of the golden image, which is the Sunday law. Um, connecting that to um, Daniel chapter uh, 11 where we have these kings, the kings of Persia, and saying that since the Sunday law there, that golden image represents the presidents of the United States, which are the kings of Persia, and he connects it to this riddle in um, Revelation 17. And that's the one where it says... Um, um, Okay, I'm just trying to find. 
can see it. Where it says there is a mind that has wisdom, but I'm just Yeah, verse nine. And here's the mind that hath wisdom. <clears throat> the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. So when Colin looks at this, he's saying that the one is is um, Trump. If I believe, I'm trying to remember how he does that as I get confused about it. So five are fallen. So he's going to have Reagan, uh, Bush the first, um, Clinton, Bush the second, and Obama. So those are the five that are fallen. The one that is, is Trump. And then, um, there's one, there's a seven one, seventh one that's going to come and it's going to continue a short space. So, that would be Biden. And then you have the eighth, which is one of the seven. And that's going to be Trump again, right? So this is his presentation that he did December 25th, 2021. Now, <clears throat> we've taken a, a long path to get to this uh, uh, passage to, to now examine it and to see if, if there's something that, that either Colin missed or that we have missed something that needs to be corrected, maybe Colin is correct, right? We have to look at all, all the options. And so what we did is we, we went through the history of those first Daniel chapter 10, of the context there of that vision, what it is that he's seeking to understand, and how chapter 10 moves into chapter 11 of Daniel with this, uh, Another riddle, riddle, I guess, or a prophecy. But, the, you know, there's shall three yet stand up in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all, and he shall stir up all against the realm of Grecia. And so in looking at those seven kings of Persia that, that we had had from the study of the seven thunders, we then looked at um, all of these different uh, lines a little bit. And then we went into the book of Esther. Now, why did we go to Esther? What was it that we were looking at in the book of Esther that was important? Why, why would we go to Esther when we're studying Daniel, Daniel chapter 11? Because Esther typifies the messages of Revelation 14 and 18, but also shows us what is going to likely occur. Okay. So so it, it, it typifies the Sunday law. But but the main thing there is that the book of Esther is about Xerxes. Right? And if Trump is Xerxes, does the book of Esther shed light on Trump, right? So so that would be the main reason. But you're correct as well. Right? So it typifies those messages of Revelation 14 and 18. It gives us a, a type of the Sunday law. And um, it definitely has aspects that parallel uh, our history in Trump. So this whole stirring up the realm of, of Grisha, that's Esther chapter one. He shall stir up. That's Xerxes who does that. And then that's so that's why we examine that. OK, and then. Uh, we we had a little bit of a diversion there. We looked at some things that Jeff was writing um, after we were trying to look at the kings again, of uh, the kings of Persia, the kings of Judah. And then uh, we went from there to uh, understanding Revelation 12 and 13. So we've gone through those. And now we're looking at Revelation uh, 17. And so we've got to this riddle. Now, one of the big things that came from reading Uriah Smith's paper, which um, I still want to go back to. So we were reading Uriah Smith, uh, what he says about these. Um, but we moved away from what Uriah Smith was talking about and just tried to look at these verses 
themselves. So one of the things is we always want to look at the symbols that are here. And so we will come back after we've studied this to what Uriah Smith says about Revelation 17. But we know that Smith holds the view of the pioneers of Adventism, the Millerite view and the view that was really held um, up until the 20th century. And that's the view that the seven heads represent uh, the seven forms of Roman government and the ten horns on this, these beasts represent the nations of Europe. And that these are, are the ones that are going to be smitten by this stone made without hands that strikes the foot of the image in Daniel chapter 2. So we, we go back to Daniel, the beasts, the image, all of these symbols of 10 are going to be that. Now this movement has taken a position um, that the heads represent Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome, Pagan, Papal, etc. of the United States and the UN being the last two of those seven heads, which is rather a unique view because I know when I became an Adventist, the view was the sixth head was communism and then uh, the seventh head was, um, uh, you know, um, I, I'm not sure if they had it as the United States. I'm not, I'm, I'm trying to remember what people had it as. Um, but it definitely, we didn't have the United States as the sixth head. Um, but this movement teaches that the United States is the sixth head. Yeah. Now, um, Angela's just in the chat pointing us to Revelation 13, 18 and 17, verse 9, where we need this wisdom. Um, and both have emphasis on numbers. One is dealing with 666. The other one is with this seven and, of course, the eight. Right. So. Um, so as we we get. We, we begin to look at Revelation 17. I mean, we started looking at it, but as we get into interpreting what these symbols are, we know that our, our movement has a position. Now, because we had gone back to the pioneer position and looked at it, it seems to me, and I think many are in agreement with me, that it's reasonable to say that the beast of Revelation 12, that the seven heads and the ten horns are not the same heads and horns in the beast of Revelation 13. That is, it's consistent in Revelation 13 to have the papal beast with the, or the what we call the leopard-like beast. It has these characteristics of Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and Rome with also this characteristic of um, the heads being these, these same nations. That would be consistent. But in chapter 12, it's much more consistent to say that the seven heads represent seven forms of Roman government. Now, when we get to Revelation 17, we know that the book of Re Revelation is written in symbols, but the symbols are often explained, right? So, right. So, for instance, and we're just going to jump here just as an example. In Revelation 17, verse 9, it says the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Is that an explanation of what the heads symbolize? Or is seven mountains also a symbol? Or is seven mountains the explanation? Because if you say the seven heads are seven mountains or hills on which the woman sitteth, we know that the woman sits where? On the beast. Well, but she also sits in Rome, right? And Rome is the city of seven hills or seven mountains. So so could it be that the seven mountains is not a symbol, but actually an explanation of the symbol of the seven heads? So is it possible that the seven heads represent the seven hills of Rome? That's just a question. Or are we to take that, as most people take it, the seven heads are seven mountains, and the mountains are a symbol, 
And, and the explanation is that they are seven kings. But then the seven kings themselves are symbols that we don't have an explanation for. So because we're not really having an explanation in this. Part of the problem with this passage is it doesn't really tell us. It's, it's this riddle, right? Right. This this here's a mind that has wisdom. We need wisdom. And so it's going to tell us this riddle. And so it does the in this riddle. Is there an explanation that the seven heads are seven mountains? And that's the explanation of the seven heads. And then it says there are seven kings and it's going to give an explanation or a way to understand what those seven kings are. Right. And then we have the beast that was and is not. He's going to be the eighth, and he's of the seven or comes up from the seven, goes on to perdition. And then it's going to talk about the ten horns, which are also ten kings, right? So we have all of these explanations of these symbols. It's going to tell you these these horns are ten kings. Well, are the ten kings symbol of something? Well, we take ten kings to represent the U.N., so we don't take them as literally ten kings, right? So I'm not sure how to answer this. All I'm saying is here is here is the problem that we have to that we're facing and that we have to solve. And so we need God's wisdom to do this. So um so we're gonna start looking at this. Now, one of the things I want to look at is this uh these passages here. Now, I know this isn't as big. I can't make this bigger um, when I have the parallel, but it's just easier to see for me. Um, so we were talking about uh, the beast and uh, the neuter, the gender of the beast, right? So when we look at this word, the beast, um, in the in the Strong's concordance number, it'll give you the number, and it'll you click on that first word that's the, and it has Greek three five eight eight, and then it's just the word ho or he or ta, depending on. Uh, this is just the definite article, right? Um, so, and these these definite articles, they can be uh, masculine, feminine, or neuter, right? So. And, and the reason why they do this in Greek, like they would in French and different things, is that you have to, um, they're, they're, they don't use word order in sentences like we do in English to know the subject and the object and how we, how the nouns and the verbs mix together. They, they use gender to do that. Um, <clears throat> so, so a beast could be feminine, but if the beast is feminine, then the definite article would also be in the feminine form. Now you can see here, right across from it, you're going to see that this is ta or to, or I guess it's, I don't know how to pronounce Greek. Um, same number, but it's then going to say, uh, when you click on this blue thing here, the part of speech, it's the definite article. It talks about the case. The case is nominative um, and the subject uh, predicate nominative. The number is singular, so there's just one. And the gender is neutral. So that means that this definite article goes with this word here, atherion, which is a wild beast, right? And, or a dangerous animal. And then we can look at the blue, and I hold the mouse over there. It says it's a noun, right? So you got the definite article going with the noun. And the case is nominative, so it, it's it, the case agrees, and the number agrees. It's singular, and the gender is neuter. So this beast that's mentioned is mentioned in the neuter. So that would be, if you're going to talk about this beast, you would normally say it, right? If you're going to talk about a beast, I mean, you could call him he um, or she. A beast could be he or she. But this beast, in this case, is neuter. It's just an it. But then it says, um, 
The beast that's that thou sawest was and is not. So when we keep looking at the Greek here, um, you're going to have this word, uh, the definite article again. But the de- definite article here is in the accusative sense. It's still singular and ner- neuter. Uh, but it's referring to thou, right? So it's not referring to the beast. This is uh, referring to the person that he's talking to. And um, and then it has this word. Um, it says the word is horeo. But you can see here the form of it is in, in Greek. It's actually it is because it's in a different form. So it's in a different, and that's what I hate about Greek, all these different uh, forms of verbs. Um, so, so it's a verb. It's the second aorist. It's in the active voice. It's in the indicative mood. It's in the second person, you. So it's talking to this person, right? Not talking about them and not talking about themselves, right? And then the number is singular. So that's why it's thou sawest, right? Um, so, so this word horeo is in this word edes. It is. Um, so it looks like a completely different word. Now we do have that in English too, where verbs like run, walk, go, went, you know, go, went, came, they all look completely different. They're called irregular verbs. So we do have that in English too, but um, anyway, and then it's going to have uh, this word uh, exist, N. So it's it's also going to be a verb. So the was, that was, uh, that sauce was, that's all it's saying here, verb imperfect, active, indicative, third, singular. And then it's going to have... Um, and is not. So it was, right? Imperfect, that just means, um, I'm not sure why it's imperfect, but anyway, and then it has the word and, which is a conjunction, right? And then it has this word, ook, um, which is, that uh, means not. It's just the negative sense. So and not was Estin, right? So now, the, now that's the form of that word. If you look it up, it'll say emi, uh, or emi, emi, but it's in a completely different form, Estin, which means uh, that it's in the, the present active indicative third person, singular, right? So, so anyway, when we look at these words, I know we, you know, we're not, we're not Greek speakers and we're, we're not Greek scholars. But one thing we can see about this is that um, it's talking about this beast and, and that the beast is in a neuter sense, right? And um, so when we look at it, it shall, uh, so 3195, um, mellow. Um, shall, and you would see here again, it, you know, and verbs are not, uh, um, like here it talks about the person, but it doesn't, it doesn't have the gender with it. That's the nouns and the definite articles. Then it has, um, this word here, uh, arise, ascend, ana, ana, uh, benio, so and I've been the end. So it's in a different form, right? So it's again doesn't there isn't any gender attached to it. Okay, so so we go through there. Now we're going to have um, the beast here later in verse eleven. It's going to say again the beast that was and is not. And again this is going to be neuter. But then it says. Even he is the eighth. And when I when it gets there, and we had talked about this yesterday, and I was, well, like, this is neuter. But actually, when you look at the word he here, the word he is actually uh, masculine. 
right? So it's um, personal pronoun, nominative case. It's singular, it's masculine. So my little I know about Greek is normally that the gender should agree in that sentence, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's a reason why they don't agree. And I don't, I don't know all the rules of Greek. Uh, but it says the beast, which is neuter, that was and is not. And then it says, even he is the eighth. Well, the word even is just that word that's regularly translated. It's chi as the word and. So it says, and he is the eighth. Now, in, in Hebrew, I know that if you have the gender, sometimes the gender can tell you that, that what looks like in English refers to the previous uh, thing that's referenced uh, means that you're looking back at some some other thing that's in the masculine form. So if you were in the masculine form and you were talking about an it, then you know that the he would actually have to go to back to something earlier that was referred to that was masculine, not to the it. But I, I don't know how this would be in the Greek. Um, now, one of the problems with the book of Revelation is it's written in broken Greek. So John was not a natural Greek speaker. He was uh, a Jew. He spoke Hebrew and Aramaic. And he writes uh, the book of Revelation with bad grammar. So sometimes you can make too much about the grammar um, uh, and, and try to say, well, it must be this way or it must be that way. Just because, you know, that would be the rules. Uh, but he doesn't, isn't always following the rules. And he's, he tends to use more the Hebrew grammar, but with Greek words. So, uh, sometimes you can sort of figure out based upon the fact he's a Hebrew write, writer. Just like if somebody who didn't speak English and they spoke, you know, Portuguese and they would say things in a certain way in English, you can kind of, if you know lots of Portuguese people who don't, speak good English, you could figure out what they actually meant, even if their grammar is bad. But we're not smart enough. We don't have enough knowledge to figure that out, right? So we're kind of dependent upon people who do know Greek. Um, but sometimes you'll see people who know Greek well, but they don't take into account that it's broken Greek. So, so it could be just he's inconsistent in how he's using the gender. Right. So so we can't make too much of that. OK, so let's let's go back just to looking at the King James. You can see this a little bit better. Hopefully that was helpful to understand some of the problems we face here. Um, so let's go to verse seven. We're going to read through this again and and then see what what we can what we can find, what will be shown to us to understand this better. And the angel said unto me, wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and the ten horns. So we know this beast, this is the great, uh, uh, this is the scarlet colored, colored beast, not the great red dragon that we have in Revelation 12. And it's not the leopard like beast. And the woman is riding this beast and the beast is, is full of blasphemies, but it doesn't have blasphemies written on its head like the beast of Revelation 13. Um, and it doesn't have, uh, you know, crowns on its head like uh, the beast of Revelation 12. And it doesn't have crowns on its horns like the beast of Revelation 13. And, and we know that 12 and 13 are the pagan Roman papal Rome. And, and what we look at is that this whole representation, the woman riding the beast on the 1843 chart is represented as papal Rome. So papal Rome in chapter 13 is represented just by this leopard like beast. But in Revelation 17, papal Rome is represented by a woman riding a scarlet colored beast. But because they are similar, we often look at the similarities and just think they must be the same thing. The heads must represent the same things for each beast. And the horns must represent the same things for each beast. But that doesn't seem to make sense on how, we, how we've been studying this. 
we have taken the position that the heads can represent different things in each of the different beasts because they're, they're in different times. Okay. So we have this woman riding this beast and the angel is going to explain to John, John, he's going to tell him the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which has seven heads and ten horns. So then in verse 8, it says, The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. So this is part of the problem that everyone has had in understanding Revelation 17. When is it that the beast is not? Now, if this beast is papal Rome, and we believe that it is, and we talked about this yesterday, can we say that the beast is not? Can we say that the beast was in the first century, in the time that John was writing? Can it be said of the papal beast that it was? Not in John's time, no. No, and, and so we can't say it was and is not. I mean, we could say it is not if it's going to be, right? You know, we say the papal beast is not, but it will be. But it also says it was. So, so it has existed. It doesn't exist, but it shall ascend. And so the best place to put that in understanding the papal beast for us would be somewhere between 1798 and the Sunday law, somewhere between that. Because when it shall ascend, we still haven't defined what that is. When does it descend out of, ascend out of the bottomless pit? But we would say that that's future. It, it's definitely after 1798. Okay. Now, of course, here it talks about the beast. Because he says he's going to uh, tell the mystery of the woman and of the beast. But first, he's going to start with the beast. Right? So the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. Now, if the woman is the papacy um, and this beast, is it true that um, if this beast is separate from the woman, right? Is it true that the kingdoms of this world upon which the woman rides, if, if we're taking this um, scarlet colored beast to be the kingdoms of this world, is there a point where we can say that the kingdoms of the world were and are not and shall ascend under the bottomless pit? Can we say that about the kingdoms of this world, because that's how we understand the scarlet colored beast. The woman riding the beast, she's the church, and she's in control of the state. She's have, she's actually having fornication with the state, right? And a relationship that is illicit. But this isn't talking about the woman that thou sawest was and is not. This is the beast that thou sawest was and is not. So can we say that of the state? Is there the kingdoms of the world? Do they cease to exist for a while? And then are they resurrected? So you're going to have to help me with this. How, how do we deal with this problem? Okay, if we, if, in, in order to deal with this problem, should we not be examining this as we have been told would need to be done for this time in our history? Should we not be looking to scripture for this? Well, that's what we've been 
doing all this oh. time, right? So we've looked at all these different scriptures, right? We looked at Revelation 13. We looked at Revelation 12. We looked at Daniel chapter 7, right? We looked at other parts of Daniel to try to understand this. So this beast, we know, we already know what Daniel or Revelation 12 is. And we already know what Revelation 13 is. And, and, the, and, and the question is, is this beast, because we have the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet mentioned in uh, the previous chapter, right, chapter 16, is it, could it be that this beast here is not the beast that the woman's riding? Even though it says I'm going to explain the woman and the beast, but now it's going to describe the beast but not the beast that we just saw, right? Okay. But something else, right? Because here it doesn't, it doesn't, to me, it doesn't follow. And we know that the beast, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet are these three parts of Babylon in Revelation 16, where three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And the beast there, it would have to be the beast of Revelation 13. The dragon would have to be the beast of Revelation 12. And the false prophet would be the two-horned beast of Revelation 13, right? Okay. Maybe my question, maybe I was not asking my question clearly. Mm-hmm. I think we're all agreed that the woman is symbolic of a church. Yeah. What is a beast? Well, a beast is a kingdom. Okay. Or it's a power, right? Yeah, it's a power. And, and we can show lots of different places where it will talk about, you know, the, the lion and the young lion and the bear, right? Representing uh, these Assyria, yeah, Neo-Babylonian Empire, the bear, Medo-Persia, things like that. Um, and, of course, things like a serpent or a dragon or water, the water monster, you know, representing in Ezekiel, representing Egypt with its scales. So beasts represent kingdoms or powers. And normally we would look at that from what we would see in Daniel 7, mm-hmm. both verses 3 and 17, but also from Revelation 4 and Revelation 5. Well, in Revelation 4, uh, the beasts there um, are different. So in Revelation 4, uh, those are living creatures, right? So those are angels. So they're not representing kingdoms or powers. Because you got, uh, that's basically, even though it's, and, and it's a different word too. It's not a wild beast. Okay. What about Revelation 5? Uh, in Revelation 5, verses 8 to 9. Yeah, that's the same thing. That's just, uh, um, those are just the animals, right? Not wild beasts. And the, and these are, of course, angels, right? These are the same ones in Revelation 4. But here, here we're talking about these in Revelation 4 and 5, we're talking about something that is, shall we say, holy? Right. Yeah. It's, it's holy. It's God's throne. It's, 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 you know, from Ezekiel chapter one and connected to that as well. So the wheels within wheels and all those, those symbols. So anyway, the point is, it's, it's just not the same word, right? So okay. it's not into kingdoms or powers. But in Revelation 17, definitely there is. And see, I mean, and we have read all of these scriptures. We've compared all of these scriptures. I've compared these, uh, compared these scriptures, you know, for the last 40 years, right? Studying Revelation, going back, reading all these different verses, cross-referencing them. So we're familiar with them, but sometimes we don't read as carefully as we should. And um, so when we get to uh, where it says the beast that thou sawest was and is not, this is supposed to be 
the angel explaining the mystery of the woman and the beast that carrieth her. So this is papal Rome. But but then it's it's going to talk about this beast, right? It's not going to mention the woman in any direct way whatsoever in this explanation until you get to verse 16, where it just says, the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, right, the woman who rides the beast, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. So one of the problems I've always had is that if the woman is riding this beast, how can she be one of the heads? Now, maybe that's just a limit of, you know, the symbolism here, right, that she could be one of the heads. But we know that it's going to be uh, these ten horns upon this beast that are going to hate the whore. They shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And then it says, the woman which thou sawest is the great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. So this great city that reigns over the kings of the earth, we understand this to be the papacy. And if it's reigning over the kings of the earth, it, it's definitely separate from this beast that it's riding. Now, so we can say that this woman and the beast together represent papal Rome at a certain point in history. But the reason why we have the beast of Revelation 13 representing papal Rome and one of the heads being the papacy is that that's consistent with the symbol there at that time. But once you have the woman riding the beast, it can't be the same beast. Right? That, if that makes sense, it can't be the same beast. Because this woman's riding it. It's not, it's not representing her. It's not representing the papacy. It's re representing the kingdoms of uh, the earth, right? So the woman uh, reigns over them, right? This great city reigns over the, the kingdoms of the earth, the kings of the earth. But it's not the kings of the earth. The woman is a church. So it's separated out in this, in this uh, imagery of this woman riding the beast. So one of the heads can't be the papacy. That's just my view. Or even one of the forms of, of government. It would argue against both um, the pioneer view and the view that we hold in regard to Revelation 17. But again, I could be wrong. There could be some way in which we could understand that. But that's always been the thing that puzzled me the most about this. That was like it's, the obvious problem. Yeah. In this situation, if, if the beasts, if this beast that we're talking about in Revelation 17 is a kingdom or a power. Mm -hmm. And if the horn that's on the beast is also representing the kings. And if the head is the supreme power of the object. Okay, well, so, so the head, because when we look at, at the heads here, right, right. it's going to say um, that the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Now, the woman sits in Rome upon the seven hills of Rome. And, and the question is, is this seven heads of this beast now not, not a symbol of the, the seven forms of Roman government, as we have in Revelation 12, or the seven kingdoms, Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome? But are they symbols of Rome itself upon which the woman sitteth? Because she's going to rule the world from the seat of Rome. And then when it says, 
and there are seven kings, that this is not referring to the heads of this beast. That the seven kings are not the seven heads of the beast, because those seven heads are seven mountains. That the seven kings are something different than uh, the seven mountains or the seven heads. That's that's a question that I have, whether that's just me being too analytical, but it doesn't say that the seven uh, heads are seven mountains that are seven kings. It just says the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And it says, and there are seven kings, right? So, so that would that would mean that we could look at these kings as something else other than the kingdoms of this world or the forms of Roman government. That this part of this riddle is is where we get caught up because we just assume that the seven heads must be, you know, either Uriah Smith's view, the pioneer's view, or the view that this movement has had. But if the seven kings are something different than the seven heads, that would allow us to look at this vision a little bit differently. It is, we have an application uh, to um, to the United States presidents already with the seven kings. Now, maybe that's that's not the correct way to look at it, but I'm just saying that if these seven kings are not the seven mountains, they're not the seven heads, but they're something different, then we would have to say, how can we bring this part of the prophecy into the time where we can say five are fallen and one is and one is yet to come? And, and so what are those things? Now, we've applied them as presidents of the United States. Maybe it's something different. Maybe there's something we're not seeing. Maybe we can't even understand this yet. Right? That's also possible. But hopefully people are sort of seeing um, that there is things that we have missed about this, this chapter. Now, when it deals with seven kings, well, we already have dealt with seven kings. We have the seven kings of Persia. Right? That's what Colin has connected it to. So we have the seven kings of Persia. But we know the seven kings of Persia wasn't our first look at seven kings. It was the last seven kings of Judah. Then the first seven kings of Persia. And then, you know, the last seven kings of Israel. And the first seven kings of, of Judah. And so we've moved around and looked at these different seven kings. But if there are seven kings, um, is this a symbol? Are kings a symbol of something? And would kings be a symbol of presidents, which are different than kings? Or is it a symbol of something else? Okay, so... And somebody have a thought there? I'm considering what you're saying. I mean, especially in relation to some of the other items that we have seemed to accept in the past. I mean... If the woman is uh, for a few comments in chat there, I don't know if they're going to be helpful, but they're there. Okay. If the woman is to be separated in this situation, that would give us a very different aspect. 
Well, it would mean that we're looking more at political power, not religious power with these um uh, with with the heads, so so I mean the heads are just seven mountains here. So this is just saying where the seat of the woman is, but it symbolizes the political power that this church has. It's through Rome that it commits this fornication with the kingdoms of this world or the kings of this world. So then, when it says there are seven kings, we were saying. Would we place this? Would we place this at the time of the end in our history with seven kings? Now, in this context, because we know we have this time of the end, and we've paralleled these different kings together, but we're going to have Reagan, who's going to make this league with Rome, right? All right. So in this context, he would have to be the first king. Now, we don't have him in the first king when we compare him with the kings of Persia. Right? We parallel when we have the kings of Persia, the first king of Persia is going to be Cyrus. And so we just look at, at um, Bush the first as the first, as the one that parallels Cyrus. And we parallel Ronald Reagan with Darius the Mede. But if we're looking at the seven kings here in this context, we then would line up the king, the first king, with Reagan. Because this is, even though we have these other patterns of seven kings, this is a different pattern of seven kings. Does that make sense? That here you would have to go Reagan, Bush the first, Clinton, Bush the second, Obama, and then the one is would be Trump, right? Did I do that right? Did I forget anybody? I think you're correct. Okay, so this would lead credence to the basic idea that Colin had. But it's now going to be a direct interpretation of Revelation 17.10 as looking at in the time in which this beast exists, this is at the end of the world. This beast is going to exist, even though it, it, it has all this history from 1798, this is after 1798, at the time before the Sunday law. And so it's going to bring us to the time where we have seven kings, Reagan, Bush the first, Clinton, Bush the second, Obama. Five, those five are fallen. The one that is, is then Trump, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. So if we're saying that these seven kings are then symbols of the, the presidents of the United States at the end of the world, to me, that makes perfect sense. So instead of having this as a repeat of history, as we have done before, we can now just directly take these seven kings and apply them to the presidents of the United States. So this, this would support what Colin was saying about these kings and how he was counting them. Now, it says the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth. Now, so who is it that's the eighth? Now, we still have to deal with the beast that was and is not. So how do we get, how do we say that this beast that was and is not is the eighth? Well, wouldn't this actually point to not, and when it says he is of the seven and goes into perdition, 
It does not say he is numbered among one of the seven or he is one of the seven. Okay? Because it's the beast. Now, is the beast one of the kings? One of the presidents of the United States? Is that a beast? No. No. Wasn't his no so so this power that has to be the eighth has to be the papal beast. It has to be this, and and that means this beast all along here that's being described here has to be the beast of Revelation thirteen, not not the scarlet colored beast. Because you can't say of the scarlet colored beast that it was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. But you can say that of the beast of Revelation 13. And that to me should be the context of the beast. So when he's describing the woman and the beast that carrieth her, he's now going to be more specific about what this, what this woman is. This woman and this beast that carries her is the beast of Revelation 13. That is, in Revelation 13, it's a leopard-like beast. But now this woman and the beast that carries carries her is this same power. It's the papacy. And it was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. It has its seat in Rome, right? So that gives us the key that it's the papacy. But then it brings up this part of the riddle. There are seven kings. These are the presidents of the United States that in our history have made a league with Rome. So there's seven of them. But the eighth is not one of the presidents of the United States because it can't be. Because one of the presidents of the United States cannot be the beast that was and is not. One of the so the seven would refer to the seven presidents of the United States, but the eighth is not one of those presidents. So whether this is right or wrong, I don't know. Right. So I'm just saying here's when we look at this and we try to put it together, this is the conclusion that we could come to. doesn't mean it's the right conclusion or that we're going to continue with this view. It's just, it's just studying together, trying to say, does this make sense? Does this make everything more consistent? Now, one of the problems with that is if we say, well, there's seven kings, five are fallen and one is, right? And we're saying that these are the presidents of the United States since connected to the time of the end. And that the one is in this context was Trump and another has not yet come. Well, then we would have to say, well, that has that other one come yet. And if the other one came and he continues the short space, is that just Biden? Right. But if that's Biden, then he's the last of the presidents of the United States in that context. But then this eighth, if this is the papacy, um, what does that mean? Does that mean that there isn't going to be any more presidents of the United States or that who's ever the next president of the United States, he is basically a papal president. We still haven't addressed the ten horns yet, but we we know that that's the UN. <clears throat> Any thoughts on that? I know it's a lot to think about. Making sense? Doesn't it have to be a people president because it brings in the Sunday law? Right. The comment on chat. Okay. Yes, it has been said that when Reagan took his inaugural oath, oath facing the obelisk, um, that's the Washington Monument, 
that it was supposed to be a signal that the U.S. government is under the papacy. I figure if this statement is true, then all the successful U.S. federal government since then, likewise, the incoming presidents would face the idol in being sworn in. So I don't know. I don't know if any if there's any truth to that, that Reagan's the first one who took his inaugural oath facing the obelisk. Anybody know? Because a lot of times you read stuff on the Internet and stuff in books even. Uh, that's completely just not true. Uh, so I don't know. I haven't. Um, I don't know if that's true. And, and I'm not sure how we would know that that's a signal. Right? I mean, who would tell us that this is a signal? What? That the United States is under the papacy. That Right? So I'd, I'd have trouble with that just because... Who says it's a signal? And and is it is this tr even true that? Now, where's the source coming from? Yeah. Well, you'd have to go back and, and research it and try to figure out what actually happened. Yeah, you would. Okay, so, but what we do know, we have a time of the end and we have Reagan there. And Reagan is the one who makes the league with Rome. Right? Because this is part of prophecy. This is part of Daniel chapter 11, verse 40 to 45, right? So, so we have that history. We know we have that league with Rome, and Reagan would be the, then the first king. If we're interpreting this correctly, then who's ever going to be president next is going to complete that work of selling out to the papacy in bringing in a Sunday law. And so whoever is going to be president um, next, then that would be the case. Now, let's say Trump becomes president again. Could we just say that Trump is just president again and that he's not the eighth, he's still just the sixth? He just happens to become president again, that we wouldn't look, that that would be a delay in this happening? And, and this idea that he is one of the seven, um, uh, this word that's and that's translated is is not normally the word is. It it's usually translated. Um, he can be translated it like he is, um, but in this context, it can mean uh, come from or or <clears throat> um, or remains. Um, so, where is this here? Uh, of Eck. come So he comes from out of the seven, or comes from the seven, or consists of the seven. So this eighth could be just the United States uh, connected with the papacy of the Sunday law. And any thoughts on that? I know it's a lot to think about. It certainly is. Okay, well, let's let's keep that in our minds, and then we're going to look at the ten horns. So we know that the ten horns. It says they're ten kings. Now, ten kings, of course, symbolize the kingdoms of this world. So that, that's not really a problem in our understanding of this being the UN. UN. They receive no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. So the beast is the eighth, right? And um, And with the beast... He's the eighth. Now he's connected with the United States. So that would include the United States because the beast is 
the eighth. He's going to be the eighth. But he's also the papacy itself. But he's also going to be the eighth of these kings of the United States presidents. And and so the UN then will unite with this eighth, right? Because they're going to receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. You shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them for he is Lord of lords and king of kings. And they that are with him are called and are and chosen and faithful. Right. So, I mean, that's consistent with what we already understand. So we don't, I don't see anything there that jumps out at me that's that's going to contradict what we just said, but actually help us understand this. But definitely these ten horns are not the same ten toes or the same, uh, you know, the ten horns in Revelation 12 or the same ten horns in Revelation 13. They're just a symbol at the end of the world. And, and the ten toes... I mean, at the end of the world, in, in the image of chapter two, which we looked at in Daniel, I mean, it's not describing the 10 divisions of Rome, like, because it's going to be Rome at the end of the world. And so the symbol 10 just symbolizes the world there. But we're going to see that the 10 horns are going to be the 10 divisions of Rome when it gets to Daniel chapter seven. So. So this is the this is the problem. If if we're just trying to keep the ten horns always the same thing, and the ten and the seven heads always the same thing, we just run into these problems where things don't fit together. But if we start to see these more as symbols, then we can see how they apply at the end of the world. So the UN, the world doesn't have to be divided into ten parts. No, literally, for that symbol to apply to the world. So this is just saying these ten horns represent the powers, all the governments of the world at the end of time that are going to receive power as kings one hour with the beast. So these are all going to work together, this one world government. They have one mind, right? And they shall give their power and strength unto the beast. So that's a one world government. That's the UN. So they're going to unite to make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them. For he's king of Lord of Lords and king of kings. And he saith unto me. So this is the angel again speaking. The waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. So we know that this is when the papacy loses its support. Right. At some point, the waters of the Euphrates are going to be dried up. Uh, and then in 1717, for God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will, that is, these ten kings or the ten horns, and to agree to give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city with reign, which reigneth over the kings of the earth. So here, is there any problem with how we've interpreted this? Is there any inconsistencies that we haven't addressed? Have we created new inconsistencies or new contradictions? There's still some things we don't know, but is there anything here that we need to address? Have we put all of the potential explanations on the table? Well, I think so. I mean, the only thing I want to do again is look at 
Um, I want to look at Uriah Smith. And I do want to go through uh, Bob Pickle's paper um, because he has a paper dealing with uh, the Ten Kings. And, and we've read some of his paper before. But, you know, he's obviously not going to look at, at uh, things the way that we do. But he's going to talk about these seven hills, seven heads or seven mountains. And he's, you know, the Aventine, the Palantine, the Capilatine, the Kaline, the Curinal, the Viminal, and the Esquiline. And then there's going to later be an eighth uh, that happens, an eighth hill that's added within the walls of Rome. Um, you know, then he talks, too, about... Uh, there's supposed to be seven kings reigning in Rome before the Roman Republic was founded. So the first seven kings of Rome, Romulus, Numa, Popilius, Tullus, Hostilius, Ancus, Marcius, Lucius, Priscius, Tarquinius, Servius, Tullius, and Lucius, Tarquinius, Superbus. He's uh, quite the last name there. Um, right. So anyway. We have different interpretations about uh, the hills and also the kings. So, so I don't think we would go back and take these hills and say that, um, you know, because you couldn't say about uh, the hills or the kings, you know, five are fallen, one is, things like that. Um, but definitely that would be the model for what happens. Yeah, so there's a, Angela points out something important there. There's a, it's a counterfeit priestly sacrifice, eating her flesh, burning her, right? Which is what the priests would do with these offerings. They'd eat the flesh of the animal, they'd burn the rest of it. So it's a holocaust or a burnt offering. Um, they must see the war versus God, God's God futile and turn on the papacy. Ewan is currently receptive to the papal instructions. As we can see, they're in agreement with the World Economic Forum, big tech, big pharma, et cetera, et cetera. So um, definitely the UN is um, in step with the papacy. I mean, really, the papacy controls the UN to a large degree. and. And the United States has, has actually helped that along um, since, you know, Reagan. Okay. So what ends up happening with, with this, as we've pointed out, is people are, are, are dug into these different um, positions regarding the heads and the horns. And we can see that if we look at this more carefully, that we can be a bit more uh, concise about the different periods of time. Um, I'm just looking at Pickle's paper here right now. Yeah, so we got about 15 minutes. Maybe what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Uriah Smith here. We're just going to read what he says. Okay. <clears throat> so one of the things is this time. Right. Um, the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth. It could be said of this beast that he is not. It could not be said of this beast he is not. And at the same time that he is the eighth head. These expressions must therefore be understood as simply setting forth the great fact that this beast would for a time exist, then seem to disappear or cease to exist, and then appear again in an active living condition without any reference to the time when these changes should occur. In accordance with these principles, let us proceed to the application. So the first statement concerning the beast is that it was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition, right? So um, he says this statement must cover the whole period of the existence of the government represented by this symbol. And as the symbol represents Rome in its whole history, the expression it was must cover the pagan form of that empire. Otherwise, there would have been no need of giving a symbol which covered Rome in its whole history. 
Now, now, of course, we're dealing with the beast of Revelation 17. But is there any reason that we would have to say um, and, and that it was, that definitely that this, the beast that was, would cover all of Rome up till 1798? But the question is that the is that the scarlet colored beast that's being referred to, or is it referring to the beast of Revelation 13? If it's the beast of Revelation 13, we can already say that it doesn't just include pagan Rome, but it would include um, uh, either it, it it includes pagan Rome and all of paganism, or maybe it just includes papal Rome. But he's going to have it uh, be about. Pagan Rome. And why is he doing that? Because he wants the seven heads to be the seven forms of Roman government, right? Yes. But that, but that doesn't make sense in chapter 13. We've agreed that in chapter 13, it's not about the, the seven uh, head, the seven forms of Roman government. It's much more consistent with this being um, uh, the different kingdoms of Bible prophecy. So, so you can see where we have these problems uh, in trying to look at what he's saying, because he's not considering any of what we're saying, because he's never considered it. In this case, the angel would have con contented himself with the symbol representing only the papacy, as, for instance, the leopard beast, of chapter 13. Then the expressions is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit or is not and yet is or is not even he is the eighth must refer to some great changes to take place in the Roman Empire, subsequently to its pagan form. See, and that makes no sense to me um, why we have to include the pagan form here, the pagan pagan Rome in this was. Because the beast that was, the beast that's being talked about is the beast of Revelation 13. It can't be the beast of Revelation 12. But he doesn't really make a great distinction between them. It's it's kind of actually hard to understand how he thinks. But so the scarlet colored beast is definitely not Rome. It's the kingdoms of the war of this world, not not Rome, not Rome in the sense of pagan Rome or even papal Rome. It's the kingdoms of this world because it's not the papacy. The beast is the kingdoms of the world, which the which is this woman sits and controls the kingdoms of this world. That's what the scarlet colored beast is. So the explanation that then is given uh, by the angel in Revelation 17 is addressing the beast of Revelation 13 for us to understand uh, who this woman riding this scarlet colored beast is. Um, yeah, so I'm going to just leave off this argument here because this is not going to be helpful. Wait, it's a long paragraph. Okay, with sufficient thought, it is very easy to drop into the conclusion that the deadly wound of Revelation 13, verses 3 and 10, refers to the time and condition of the beast when it is said of it in Revelation 17, 8, and 11, that it is not. And he says, but that cannot possibly be the case. The expression, it is not, denotes that the power as a subject of prophecy ceases to exist. This could not be said of that experience in which it only receives a deadly wound, which is healed before life becomes extinct. Looking over the whole history of Rome and considering that the scarlet colored beast of Revelation 17 takes in both the daily and the transgression of desolation of Daniel 8, we can see very clearly where the expression was not must come in. It was in the transition from paganism to the papacy. Uh, it was in the transition from paganism to the papacy when the daily paganism was taken away and the place of his sanctuary was cast down and the beast under its pagan form as a persecuting power ceased to exist. The beast for a time was not, but under a new form, after some two centuries or more, it reappeared as the papacy and the persecution began again. 
It was an end of one form of the beast, and it was not, till it assumed another form. This meets completely the end of the papacy. Um, but as already remarked, the wounding of one of the heads would not by any means meet said conditions. Okay. In the case of the wounding of the head, the life of the beast is recognized as continuing right along for the prophecy after saying that he had wounded, wound by a sword. It does not say that he did die, but that he had wound by a sword and did live. But he received a wound, which if it had been healed, would soon have resulted in death if it had not been healed. It is most infelicitous to say, I don't know what that means. Um, I know what felicity is happiness. Most unhappy expression, maybe to say, as some do, that the papacy was wounded by the Reformation in the sense of this prophecy, though not complete till the overthrow in 1798. For that was simply the earth opening her mouth and swallowing up the flood sent out to destroy the church. Okay, so anyway, what he's doing is he's making an argument that when the, and this is, is you know, it's an interesting argument. It's a beast that was and is not. But the is not, he's going to place at, not in John's time, which which is kind of tough, because he's just going to include that, I guess, in the fact that it's in the time of pagan Rome, that uh, pagan Rome is going to cease before papal Rome takes over. But do we see that sense in which, I mean, maybe you could do it that way. I don't know. I don't think this is a good enough argument to to change back to the pioneer view. Um, because as we can see that this is not, this is dealing with chapter 17 when it talks about the beast there. Definitely has to be the beast of Revelation 13, not the beast of Revelation 17, so to speak. Okay, so he's dealing with this deadly wound being healed. Um, now, can we find anything in the spirit of prophecy that would contradict what he is speaking about here? Anybody know offhand? Because Ellen White says the infliction of the deadly wound points to the downfall of the papacy in 1798. So does that just not directly contradict what Uriah Smith has just said? Absolutely. Yeah, this is it. Yeah. So Ellen White says uh, the infliction of the deadly wound points to the downfall of papacy in 1798. This is page uh, 579 of the Great Controversy. After this, says the prophet, his deadly wound was healed and all the world wandered after the beast. Paul states plainly that the man of sin will continue until the second advent. To the very close of time, we carry forward the work of deception. And the revelator declares, also referring to the papacy, all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life. Revelation 13, 8. In both the old and new world, the papacy will receive homage in the honor paid to the Sunday institution that rests solely upon the authority of the Roman church. So, I mean... If, if, if I was reading Uriah Smith correctly, he was trying to uh, place that uh, earlier, the deadly wound in the period between pagan and papal Rome. Um, but I could have been reading him wrong. So, so we know the deadly wound represents, and that fits in with what we've said because that's what we, how we've understood it, that the beast that thou sawest was, so the papacy existed, controlling the kingdoms of this world, right? And is not, 
So that's in the period from 1798 prior to the Sunday law. It's, it is not, but it will come into power again through the Sunday law. So that's consistent. Any other thoughts? Because my mind is um, breaking down now. It's a lot of things that we've studied here. A lot of things we have to think about that we have to come back to tomorrow. So, so what I think is tomorrow we we will. Um, I'm going to go over Uriah Smith's paper and try to bring out the things that are pertinent, and we'll look more in detail at Bob Pickle's paper. Um, but I think we should be able to finish up this part of this study and then go back to Daniel chapter 11 um, and finish that off the rest of this week. Unless other things come up. Any final thoughts? Not for me at this moment. Okay, well, let's close in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful for the study that um, we've had this morning. We know that um, there's a lot there to think about, Lord. And I know that we need the time to study this on our own. I pray that you can be with each person as they open your word together. And that if there's error in my understanding, in our understanding, that you can correct it. Uh, Be with us throughout this day and bring us together again. According to thy will, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.